to welcome to all those who have joined us for webinar 170 since the Indian Health Organization Convenio Hipólito Unanue, starting the webinar series in May 2020. The COVID-19 pandemic also teaches us that the capacities built and strengthened in these three years must not be rolled back and health must remain at the center of the policies. Research, epidemiological and genomic surveillance, vaccine and drug development, and the deployment of health promotion and prevention measures are essential for a caring society. Reflections on these and other priorities relevant to health and well-being can be found in the monthly Noti Salud Andinas newsletter available on the Indian Health Organization's website. We invite you all to leave your name, organization and country in the comment box of the Facebook chat or the YouTube live. In that same space, you can also leave your questions or send them via email to webinarhorasconu at gmail.com. To access the certificate of attendance, you will find in the Facebook or YouTube live chats a fixed link. Please fill out the short survey and leave your email. We will be grateful to verify that your email is spelled correctly for sending the certificate, which will be sent in the coming days to your email. In this webinar, we will follow the usual dynamics. We will start with the institutional greeting, then we will listen to the lectures of our speakers, and finally, we will move on to the Q&A session. Very well, then. At the beginning of this important day, I will give the floor to Dr. Maria de Carmen Calle Davila, Executive Secretary of the Andean Health Organization, who will give the institutional welcome and greetings. Go ahead, Dr. Calle, please. Thank you very much, Gloria. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. As you know, for Horas Conu, the effective exercise of the right to health of its population is fundamental and is considered in the institutional vision as well as throughout its 50 years of work through progressive integration and also a network of cooperation. Mental health, including neurodiversity, has become a challenge for the public health systems of the Andean countries. Therefore, the Executive Secretariat of the Andean Health Organization, Hipólito Unanue Agreement, Horas CONU, has considered exploring the situation and challenges to make people with autism spectrum disorder, hence ASD, visible and thus contribute and promote to the effective exercise of the rights and quality of life. The United Nations established April 2nd as the World Autism Awareness Day. And every year, the Andean countries promote awareness campaigns with the aim of making the population more aware of the specificity of autism, empathize with autistic people and their families, and thus contribute to improving their quality of life and their equal participation in society. Autism is not linear, but rather a spectrum, a diverse condition. And although autistic people share the same diagnosis, each one of them is different from the others and have their own abilities, needs, and also interests. For this reason, individualized and specialized support is required, should be adjusted to each stage of life to promote their social participation under equal conditions. In recent years, considerable progress has been made in the awareness and acceptance of autism. And this is because more and more health professionals, educators, researchers, and academicians 
have moved away from the idea of curing to focusing on accepting, supporting, including, and advocating. This is a great challenge for all the people with autism, for their allies, for the neurodiverse community, and also the world at large, as it allows them to reclaim their dignity and self-esteem and to fully integrate as valued members of their families and of the societies. However, people with autism continue facing discrimination as well as other challenges. Like all groups, they possess a wide range of talents and challenges that are often not recognized by the society in which they live, both because levels of awareness and acceptance, access to health and education, vary from country to country, as well as because for various reasons, such as the pandemic, wars, natural disasters, among others, they are exposed to changes in their daily routines and lives. The Andean Health Organization, the Oras Conu, does not want to end the month in which the Autism Awareness Day is commemorated without developing this webinar with the aim of raising awareness on the subject, generating possible responses that will contribute to promote and strengthen the effective exercise of the rights of people with autism spectrum disorder or ASD. In order to learn about the current situation, experiences and actions that are being developed, we have invited three experts today who are experts on the subject matter, who will share with us their very valuable experiences, to which, who we thank for their excellent and important presentations. I don't want to fail to mention that this is the webinar number 170. From the very moment the Andean Health Organization started in May 2020, I only have uh, grateful words for my team, for my team and the experts who always join us in these presentations who are making this possible week in, week out to share knowledge, to attain greater health and well-being in our 168 million inhabitants. Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. Well, thank you very much, and you are all welcome to this important event. Thank you very much, Dr. Calle, for your words. Now, after the greeting of our Assistant Secretary, introduce myself. I am Gloria Lagos Eizaguirre. I am the Manager of Strategic Lines and International Cooperation at the Andean Health Organization. And today, I will be in charge of moderating this webinar. Well, after this uh, preamble to discuss the importance of early diagnosis, we would like to welcome Dr. Daniel Koch. He's a medical specialist in neuropediatrics at the Instituto Nacional de Salud del Niño de Breña in Peru, where he was also the executive director of research support and specialized training. He has also served as the chief physician of the Instituto Nacional de Salud del Niño in San Borja, also in Peru. Dr. Koch was a professor at the Faculty of Medicine of the Universidad Mayor de San Marcos, tutor of residence at the faculties of the Universidad Cayetano Heredia and San Marcos, professor at the Faculty of Psychology of UNICEF and coordinator responsible for the medical residency at Universidad Particular Ricardo Palma. He is also a member of the Peruvian Society of Neurology, the Peruvian Society of Pediatrics, and the American Epilepsy Society. Go ahead, dear Dr. Daniel Koch. The space is all yours. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And I have a long-standing friendship with you by now. I have 20 minutes for this presentation, I think. To, yes, that's right. 
we will try to be short because this is actually a very extensive topic. So, okay, the autistic spectrum disorder is very frequent and interesting, more frequent than you would think. There are some examples of some very specific characters, uh, Beethoven, Mozart, Newton, Einstein, Bill Gates, and the Olympic swimmer who has won so many medals, who is said to be autistic. And also, this is something that's been discussed in the movies. Rain Man, Dustin Hoffman, won the Oscar for this performance. And we have Leonardo DiCaprio and Johnny Depp here in What's Eating Gilbert Grape. And this is something that is being broadcast in, in Netflix because Ben Affleck is supposed to play an autistic person. From the 80s, there's been an increase in the incidence of this um, issue. And not only in the US, also in other countries. In the 90s, they said there were 10 in 10,000 against four in 10,000 in previous decades. And in the last report uh, of 2021, out of 59 uh, eight-year-olds uh, are within the ASD. This is also a public health issue. The causes, well, there is. it's very likely due to better registration and changes in the definitions. In the first definitions by Kanner in the 40s to date, the definition has uh, become more relaxed, I think. There are also genetic factors. In 1980, 0.07% of ASD in the US and the educational uh, special services in the past five years have increased by 91%. And this is also something that had a very important impact in our society because there's no where to send them for therapy. It's full of patients. There are no, uh, there's a long waiting list. And regarding epigenetics as a predisposing a factor of autism, nutrigenomics seems to have a very important uh, aspect to play here because there are very important processes to consider. We also know about the relationship with uh, high fructose corn syrup, one of the agents that seem to be related to autism and it's very uh, deeply studied in the US. As I was telling you, Kanner in 1943 discovered the first cases, but these are the most notorious cases, the tip of the iceberg, the most severe cases described by Kanner. And Asperger simultaneously described the most subtle cases. And I think that Asperger was even before Kanner. I've worked for the, I've worked on this uh, research. What are the neurobiological causes? Well, the, for many, many time, the poor mother was supposed to be the indirect responsible for these type of problems. They even were speaking about refrigerator mothers who were not effective, but the relationship is now very clearly established. The definition, well, basically uh, compromise of communication, difficulties in socialization and a behavior full of restricted interests and repetitive uh, behaviors and routines and an early start. This goes back to the 90s. In 1994, we started defining ASC, the severity degree. Well, it depends on the magnitude of the support required by the person to, to thrive. There's moderate uh, support, substantial support, and greater substantial support. It's just, um, actually very ambiguous. It's not being well defined. It much depends on the language capacity, also on the uh, cognitive deficiency degree, how within the spectrum someone might uh, fulfill uh, himself or herself. Now, uh, among the criteria for diagnosis, we have compromised social interaction, 
with the efficient communication, uh, nonverbal behaviors, poor empathy, uh, understanding empathy is uh, something to consider. You would think that a patient with autism does not have feelings, but this is not the case. They have feelings, of course they do. What happens is that they, uh, they cannot uh, imitate their surroundings. They might recognize uh, pain in others, but this is not something contagious. Deficient communication skills, and this is also important for pediatricians and nurses who are screening children, who are following up healthy children. It, they need to understand that this is not only about weight or, or, or size. There are a series of activities that the children need to follow, the issue of language, the issue of communication, and if there is language, if it's adequate and in the in the role play, for instance, oftentimes the family is very happy because the child is using the cubes, they are uh, playing with shapes, but role play, role play is an essential part of their subsequent development. Imagination, playing food, playing the doctor, this is also something which is very important. Marked concern and an unusual interest. This is something to consider. The dinosaurs now are very common. They used to be not so common. Might be valid if there is an excessive interest on them. And males' interest in, in cars, I think this is not valid because this is not a good example. Adherence to routines or rituals, repetitive uh, patterns, uh, motor stereotyping like spinning or revolving around their their axis or spinning the wheels of a small car for the diagnosis six or more social behavioral language or at least two social one behavior one language this has been modified with time and now in Asperger, which was a different entity before, it was apart from autism, now it is falling within the umbrella of ASD. Asperger does not show a significant language delay. The language has certain peculiarities, but it's not a delay. However, the non-specified uh, criteria are also included here. There's compromise in the three areas, but without completing for autism or Asperger. The spectrum has grown a lot because of this, and this is why diagnosis is so ample. Visual contact might not be enough, so I could uh, state that it, this is part of ASD. And severity, severity defined basically by intellectual compromise, not necessarily cognitive deficiency. Cognitive deficiency is more common in autism than in the people at large. Language compromise also is something to consider uh, within the severity criteria. But an associated medical condition, there are some medical genetic uh, problems uh, related, which is uh, very frequently associated to autism or compromise of an associated neurodevelopment. Asperger patients with more intense hyperactivity. And this is the reason for consultation. And early diagnosis. Why is it important to carry out a early diagnosis? Because the sooner, the better. The neurodevelopment process, the synaptogenesis, the myelinization, neurogenesis is also part of this. They are more intense in the first five years of life and even more so in the first three. If we intervene early on before two years of age, 
we might modify the possibility of having dramatic changes is much higher than when they are five already. How to perform a early diagnosis? Irritability, none or no uh, response to stimuli and motor deficit in Asperger, this is also interesting to consider. Remember when they said that Messi was a Asperger? Messi is, is a shy, not uh, an Asperger. And what about screening tools? Well, as I was putting it before, from 18 to 24 months of age, screening tests are also available, but mainly trying to identify behavioral changes in development. Comorbidities and also genetic analysis are very important right now. It's still very expensive though, but there will come a time where it will be a common part of the screening. About cognitive skills, 60 to 70% have mental uh, delay. Asperger, it's not that they are all geniuses, but the their IQ is normal. The compromise in very specific areas will also uh, be reflected, and we have the savants. I don't remember. Well, if you saw Raymond, this is a study, this is a, a film that is based on a real case where this character was a savant. He could do very difficult things, but he was not capable of doing very simple things like buttoning his shirt. He could count, like, you remember about the matches? He could, could, could count all the matches. And Tom Cruise was taking him to the to Las Vegas. Well, you have to watch the movie. <laughs> I'm not an expert on language. Uh, there are experts. There are experts on language therapy. 20 to 30 percent are non-verbal. 25 percent experimented regression. And this is when. People think this has to do with immunization or vaccines. Pre-verbal commitment is also compromise is also something part of this. Um, Two-word sentences by two, two ages, two years old, two words, and echolalia and some other language characteristics are very typical. Pharmacological treatment. Well, there's hyperactivity, aggressive aggressiveness, and a series of narrow neuropsychiatric problems in the social arena, some experimental drugs, which have not been well defined yet. And adipiprazole and risperidone. Risperidone is a first line drug. The sleep disorders are very frequent. 40, 86% of alterations, it affects the whole family. And the use of melatonin here is generalized. It's very safe, by the way. And I think that the medical uh, staff working with children uh, have to learn to use melatonin. There are some other conditions, as I mentioned already, developmental conditions, psychiatric and behavioral uh, conditions as well, and also medical medical conditions. Seizures, seizures are also something to consider because it's uh, very frequent. Most of them uh, have these manifestations after 10. Women have an increased risk the likelihood of having epileptic seizures is higher. And here we are mentioning some of the drugs that are used. Alternative and complementary medicine is also important because the most desperate uh, parents have access to these uh, alternative treatments. They are seeking one way or another 
another way out. And these are practices, health systems, and products which are not part of traditional medicine. Conventional medicine is based on uh, scientific evidence. And there are also risks to consider because there are treatments which might be very dangerous for health, like metal chelation. There are even children who died in the US. And the gluten and casein free diets, which might work for one out of 10. But we don't know who will get better. You need to use a nutritionist to implement the diet. And if it does not work in three months, well, this is where everything ends. What about the prognosis? It will depend on certain positive factors like shared attention, functional capacity for play, high cognitive abilities. The symptoms should be decreasing. And early identification is of the essence. Early intervention, also therapies. Good part of the consult is to encourage parents to change things at home. And one of the things that I uh, always mention is the individual lives of both mom and dad, because there is a terrible impact on them. And of course, uh, let alone those kids who do not have the same problem. This is something that we have to consider very highly and something that we always need uh, to do or should do is inclusion with uh, normal peers. We have, we try to uh, include them so that they might imitate and copy activities of children without problems. The negative factors, um, it's lack of functional language by five, lack of shared attention by four, an IQ less than 70, if there's medical comorbidities or neurodevelopmental comorbidities, and of course, severe symptoms. Association with vaccines. This is also a fear from parents. This study that we all know by Wakefield has uh, harmed everyone a lot. There are preventable outbreaks, and this is a temporal association, actually, to the rubella vaccine, the thimerosal. cell, but there were cases before vaccines came along, and there are clinical trials which have shown that there's no relationship with vaccines. Conclusions. The definitions are controversial because the definitions are changing uh, with time. The last definition goes back to seven or eight years, changed a lot, and I'm sure that this could change even more. The severity will be depending on the independency degree. Genetic factors are important. The early diagnosis is fundamental, and this is why we need to work on this. The behavioral uh, issues might be taking the lead when we consider therapy. And there's occupational therapy, uh, which is considered first. Let's not forget the family. I always ask uh, who's most important at home. And remember that mothers are the most important character at home. They have to look after themselves because otherwise things won't work. What happens when I have a two to three year old before me? Everything will depend. Parents are desperate. They need a diagnosis, a definite diagnosis, but we have to see how they evolve with time. And complementary medicine or supplementary medicine is all about information. Well, I think that this is the last uh, slide. I try to move fast within my assigned time. 
So I hope that I have complied with my assigned time. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Koch, for your presentation. Actually, it's a, a very important presentation. There are more timely diagnosis of autism now, so it is important to have more uh, space for this. The characteristics of uh, autism will have to be analyzed from different viewpoints. Early diagnosis is important, and if it's diagnosed before the age of two is something important. You also mentioned something here, which is the holelessness that they need to receive in terms of treatment and also complete this with uh, complementary or supplementary medicine versus conventional. Well, not versus, but they uh, go hand in hand, I would say. And also, you say that it is important, and this is something that's uh, worth highlighting, that the family has to work with them. They need to live within an environment of support, and they need to be included in regular schools where they can express, where they can see other children and develop in, in the, the most natural way, I would say. And something else is that each one of us, where we are, we need to contribute to not uh, relating autism with vaccination. And this is something that we need to achieve by sharing qualified information. Let's not provide just information per se, but be informed, be educated, so that the information, that it's the right information, should go out. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. You are invited to stay in the room because we, we have some questions at the end of this webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for your participation. Thank you. I have to go. I'm sorry. I have to work at the hospital. I have a very tight schedule, but thank you very much. I, I'm always willing to collaborate. We understand, Doctor. We thank you for the uh, words and space that you have given us. Thank you very much. Now, to address the autism spectrum disorder from the neurodiversity approach, a path to resignification, we would like to welcome Dr. Minerva Ortiz Valladares. Dr. Valladares is a psychologist with a PhD in biomedical sciences and currently holds a master's degree in neuropsychology from Mondragon University in Mexico. She's certified in autism diagnosis with tests in Spanish by the Medical Association of Child Psychiatry and the Association of Certified Professionals in Autism Detection and Diagnosis. She is the creator of the outreach website, La Ciencia en Tus Manos, and coordinates the Semillero de Jóvenes Investigadores, Young Researchers Seedbed, whose purpose is to invite young people to scientific research. She was a collaborator of the Entender program, a program that aims at improving access, retention, graduation, and employment prospects of neurodiverse people. Currently, she's a professor researcher at the Faculty of Psychology at the Universidad of Colima, where her line of research is focused on the effects of the early environment on neuro development and belongs to the National System of Researchers, SNI. She provides neuropsychological care in private practice at the Neuropsic Colima Clinic. Go ahead, Dr. Ortiz, the space is yours. Hello, and thank you very much for the invitation. I would like to share my screen first. I don't know if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. We have 20 minutes. It's 1140. So please 
be mindful of time. I will uh, speak about the autistic uh, spectrum disorder and I would like to give like a brief introduction. Neurodiversity right now is something that's been resumed and it's been having a big impact because it brings us to new ways of looking after neurodiversity and generating and recognizing that much of uh, what we need to do within this situation has to do as well with the context where boys and girls and, and children are immersed in. Well, first of all, what is ASD? Well, we know now that it is a group of neurological differences considered um, to result from neurodevelopmental changes. This is no longer a deficiency, it's a difference, and this changing the perspective. Why? Uh, what is the theology of autism spectrum? It has different factors, environmental factors. There are gene and environment interactions, and there are genetic factors which have been related to autism, like the uh, fragile X, and there are environmental factors which have to do with parents' age, fetal environment, perinatal events like hypoxia, uh, smoking, alcohol consumption by some of the parents, nutrition, exposure to toxins, and the uh, psychosocial environment. Among the genetic factors, we see that the immune function has or might have something to do. Neuroinflammation inflammation has been described as a, as, a, as a factor. Neuroinflammation might be generated because of different situations, even the diet that they are taking. And the doctor mentioned a while ago, diet high in fructose is uh, one of the characteristics or one of the diets which has uh, the, the neuroinflammation is one of the characteristics that has been observed. This interaction that has to do with the environment, genetic factors which have be could be predisposing, and this interaction can lead to um, the ASD. This does not mean that because there is one of these situations, this is something that will uh, trigger autism. There are risk factors, but we also have protective factors. There will be other predisposing factors, but this won't happen until there's a triggering factor. It, we have to consider neurodevelopment issues, and we have to include all these variables We are part of the that are part of the different pathologies to try to find the more adaptive ways, more feasible ways to avoid damage. What can we see in autism? There are different aspects of a child development being affected. Language, social functioning, behavior, and cognitive uh, development. We will regularly focus on the DSM-5, which provides the more up-to-date uh, characteristics. We will definitely find deficiencies a persistent difference, deficiencies in social interaction and communication. The next one has to do with restrictive and repetitive behaviors, interests, and activities. It has to do with movement, the use of ob ob objects. This does not mean that because th there are some of these behaviors present, it will be determining there's an excessive lack of flexibility to routines. They have patterns that are uh, like rituals, and we can see this in uh, verbal and nonverbal behaviors, and there are restricted interests. This is something that um, I think is very important in adults 
there's a part where we have some masking of our symptoms and this will hinder the timely diagnosis. Something that we observe in adults is this restricted interest part. This might uh, make some noise even in adults. We will have to then create the strategies to improve uh, short and, and long-term lives. When the spectrum, when they need, they, they don't need much help, this is when we start masking. This has happened with patients where I observe and I ask why, for instance, did you stop moving or why are you fisting your uh, hands? If I'm not doing this, my hands will move. As an adult, they start to suppress some behavior, causing some problems in us identifying these uh, manifestations. Something that we can observe is the hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory stimuli. Something that I mentioned before that they, because of uh, evolution, uh, because of evolution, we can see what's surrounding us, but the observation of some details is something that uh, is very common in the autism spectrum. Symptoms have to be present in the first stages of development, though we can observe these interactions in their behavior. Sometimes we cannot diagnose this. They are observed as being adults, and this is where we are trying to prepare a described clinical chart where we can describe all of those things that parents took as part of normality, but actually it will generate information to mm, diagnose them even as adults. The D criteria is symptoms causing clinically significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of usual functioning. And the last criterion is these alterations that are not best explained by intellectual disability, intellectual developmental disorder, or global developmental delay. This is something that we use as an important practice for differential uh, diagnosis. Now, I will refer to the uh, word spectrum. This is something new. Before, we used autism. Now, we know that this is not the case, that any all of the people having ASD will have different ways of behaving and they won't be equally affected. We cannot speak about autism as something linear, more autism or less autism. We cannot handle things like this. So this is actually a spectrum. We took eight categories where people develop and there have been some uh, differences vis-a-vis -vis the norm. We have social skills, attachments, routines, sensory problems, stereotypes, perceptions, functions, and others. We can find this type of alterations, but there are different levels, and this will not make them either more or less autistic. This is something that we wanted to eradicate, and this is why seeing this as a spectrum has taken us to where we are now, where we won't uh, be speaking about uh, severity. I always mention this, uh, people's are, pe people are not machines, we are not computers. <laughs> it's not either we work or not. We are moving in different, uh, in a different spectrum of life. So starting with this, we cannot say that I'm healthier because I'm functioning more or less. So the functionality will then turn into something that will remove these human capabilities that we all have as human beings. So 
There might be alterations in different categories, which are already been mentioned, which are causing difficulties in their social relationships and the way they perceive themselves, where participation of external people are essential for their development in degree two. We need, uh, they need help where they still have a certain need, but they also have skills which might uh, help them feel better or have a, a greater capacity to adapt. And there might be different levels where there might need help. Something that we need to acknowledge is that within the spectrum, people will always require our support and our acceptance and recognition, not only in the sense that we might be able to help them, but about dignifying the way that they see the world. And this different world will generate something special. I always say this, maybe if we see this from neurodiversity, there are genetic variations, and these genetic variations will respond to the demands of the environment. And then we will no longer require them notably. Let's think about something which, uh, well, let's uh, see this as uh, we saw in the, uh, the t times of the cavemen. maybe observing things that might harm them. And then these skills won't be necessary any longer. And we will start creating new strategies that will be automa automated. These modifications will be kept and we will observe them within the spectrum. This does not mean, I'm sorry, but she's speaking way too fast. This does not mean that there is a genetic variation that responding to a demand at a given point in time. So this will be kept for a long time. We see this in something as basic as uh, uh, some things that we still keep. And this does not mean that we are doing good or wrong. This is just a genetic variation. So now, entering into this point, I want to leave this um, face. Nature is diverse, and so is the human brain. This has helped us distinguish and establishing autism from other channels. Who was the first person who discussed this? It was Judy Singer. She coined this term. And she's a person within the spectrum, and she had daughters within the spectrum. And in her PhD thesis, she's using this uh, term also. She coined the term neurodiversity to promote equality and inclusion of neurological minorities. And there are others which belong to the neurodiversities. And one of the largest promoters is Nick Walker, who says that the diversity of human brains and minds is infinite. There's an infinite variation in neurocognitive functioning within our, our species. And recognizing this will remove this uh, normality, normality, idea that we all have specific characteristics and this will help us be here. So what's not neurodiversity? The neurological, sensory, communication, and social characteristics which have uh, natural differences in the human uh, development. 